traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you are doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition. Traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Now, what is flocculation? when making cheese and how does it affect my cheese today i'm going to revisit home cheese me- making and talk a little bit about each of the steps into creating any cheese and i'm going to pause in the middle and talk in more detail about flocculation it can take your home cheese making to the next level I want to take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners. Welcome back to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the farm cast for every episode. I appreciate you all so very, very much. Thank you. I'm starting off as I always do with our homestead life updates. I'm going to try and put a timestamp in the notes for those of you that want to skip the homestead updates and get straight to the unique topic of the podcast. I'm not sure I know enough to make that happen, but I'm, I'm going to make the effort and we'll see how it goes all right let's talk about the cows a couple of the cow matrons are showing their pregnancies claire will be 11 years old shortly after having her calf this year now she's getting up there in cow years uh, they can live 15 or 20 years or so but she's definitely uh, getting old enough to start showing her age I was out there checking on everyone a few days ago, and I caught Claire in the act of trying to get up from her afternoon lay down and chewing of cud. And in order to make this happen, she rocked and rocked and rocked and rocked for nearly a minute, I think, before giving herself that big oomph and getting her up on her rear legs and then finally getting uh, her front legs under her. She looked a little bit stiff, but after moving around a bit, she seemed pretty normal. Last year, she did the same thing. But this year, it seems like it's taking her a bit longer than usual to get up. Maybe it was just a particularly cold day. I don't know. I'll put in a call to the vet to get some guidance just to be safe. And the same for Rosie. I need to ask the vet more details about what to look for as she nears her delivery date. Rosie is about six to eight weeks at the very most away from giving birth to her first calf. And we're watching her very closely. Her udder is starting to form up. Uh, Again, if you're just tuning in, we purchased Rosie in the fall, even though we suspected she was bred and was quite young to be having a calf. Uh, But we we brought her home anyway. She's a beautiful young calf. And sure enough, when we got the cows preg checked, she was pregnant and due to deliver in mid-March or so, we estimated. Um, Her age of conception would be similar to like a nine-year-old girl who just had her first period. You know, sure, she was old enough to conceive, but not fully grown to an age where pregnancy is considered safe. So we'll keep you updated on that progress. The donkeys, the goats, and the sheep are doing great. The donkeys are still coming up every day for a treat and a pet, and the sheep are doing well, both flocks. There is the breeding flock out in the front pasture, and those girls, four of them, are due to start having lambs at the end of March. So they're starting to show their pregnancies also. Lambert's taking good care of his ewes. Then there are 12 in the back. Nine are last year's lambs and three are ewes that we didn't want to breed this year. So those are all the younger animals. And we had to make a quick change with the goats. Goats and sheep are prone to what is called hoof scald that can lead to hoof rot. It's bacteria in the soil when it gets cold and wet and the bacteria will get in in, in their hoofs and just messes them up. And we, we've never had a problem with our sheep, but the goats are a never-ending disaster with these problems. And this year, we moved them to their own pasture away from the other animals. And what happens is that all the animals are standing around the hay bale, and they eat, and they in- inevitably, they do their business there. And when it rains, all of that waste and rain and mud just becomes a thick, muddy mess. And this is a problem for our goats after... After that rain and snow combined with cold temperatures, we often see the goats begin to limp. We got them out of there 
and gave them their own space so that they are not standing in that wet, poopy, muddy mess. And their their hooves just don't do well in that environment. Cold, wet, and the proper bacteria will just take them down. Now, of course, after we moved them to their own pasture, they decided they wanted to be in another pasture. That one was also vacant, so we let it pass. Everyone looks to be doing well at this point. And we are going to get uh, what's called a foot bath for the goats and probably the sheep too. We'll just start running them through there when it gets cold and wet. Uh, after a, a good cold, rainy, wet spell, run them through there to, to kind of sterilize their hooves. All right. The quail are, they'll, <laughs> they are still being amazing and acting like winter's no big deal. Most days they are all laying eggs. If it gets too cold, they really will not lay eggs. So the fact that the eggs keep coming tells me they are doing just fine in the cold. So yay, quail. Let me talk a little bit about the garden. This time of year gets me starting to kind of twitch and itch to start growing some plants. Uh, I had not planned to grow any tomatoes this year. I'm planning, planning on focusing on beans and peas just growing lots of beans and peas in the garden, probably selling some, a lot of them at the market. But just today I started thinking about what if I grow some tomato plant starts for folks at the farmer's market? I mean, just because I'm not going to grow them for us doesn't mean that other people won't want them. And so many of you do not have the space and equipment to grow them from seed. So uh, it is quite the operation. What do you think? Tomatoes, maybe some peppers? What about herbs? You all likely want some basil, parsley, cilantro, and so on. So the jury's still out on that one, but I will say I'm leaning heavily towards growing some stuff, and those sound like really good plants to make it happen. A little bit on the creamery. Uh, uh, we have actually, we've opened up new raw milk cheese herd shares. If you're interested in regularly obtaining some fabulous raw milk cheese, the half share will provide about a pound of cheese per month. A full share will provide about two pounds of raw milk cheese per month. Uh, you do have to be able to come to the farm to pick it up or form a group that would come and pick it up. And you can do that once a month when you are when you have a cheese and butter herd share. Now, the outside of the creamery is nearly complete. we got walls, roof, soffit, knee walls, dormer walls, whatever else Scott did to make it work. It is so exciting. I'm waiting for that scaffolding to come down. The scaffolding makes it look like a building under construction. And it is. But I look forward to the day when I can look at the building without it. This is the most beautiful building. Follow us on Facebook at Peaceful Heart Farm to see Scott's updates and pictures of the progress of the creamery. He just really is a fantastic, fantastic uh, builder. Now, as we talked over how the interior building was going to progress, because that's coming up next, I tried to work out if I was going to be able to make cheese in the cheese make room this year. Looks like no. At least not in the beginning. There, There's a small possibility that I would be able to get in there about the time we stop milking. Maybe just one cheese before the end. It'll be whatever it is, and I will love it no matter what. Speaking of making cheese, what does flocculation mean when making cheese? That's what I want to talk about. And I'm going to walk through the basic steps, steps of cheese making once again. I've got a couple of podcasts where I, uh, I've i talked about cheese making. Um, it's not as hard as you might think. If you get these steps down in your head, when you finally get the courage to give it a try, you'll have the basics already in mind. Often the instructions can look really intimidating, but when you break it down into steps that you are trying to accomplish, it makes it much easier. You're going to do this. You want this to happen. You want this to happen. So if you're already making your own cheese, I hope the additional information about flocculation will make your cheese making even better. And if you don't make cheese at all but love eating it, these are the steps that make it happen for you. These steps that I'm going to talk about, it's going to be very rudimentary. And if you're at the stage of just wondering what you need to get started, I actually have a two-part podcast on uh, the You Can Make Your Own Cheese there, there's two podcasts in that, and they go over the basics of things like space and equipment and supplies and all of those kinds of things, uh, presses and just stuff like that. What do you need to do to get started? All right, so actually, let's talk about the steps of cheese making. Step one, sanitize everything. Cheese is the result of bacteria, molds, and yeast 
interacting with the milk. And you want to make sure that that you have all the right ones and none of the wrong ones. You control this by sterilizing everything, getting rid of all of the bacteria, and then adding in what you desire, except the raw milk. If you can use raw milk, that is fabulous because you got some really good natural cultures and bacteria in there that you want to maintain. All right, so sterilize everything. Then, number two, you're going to heat up the milk to the proper temperature for ripening. And that means you're going to raise the temperature of the milk to the proper temperature where the cultures that you've chosen to use in your cheese will flourish. Too cold, not enough happens. Too hot, they all die. Um, and so, and you've got different temperatures. You have a mesophilic cultures, which are medium temperature, and then thermophilic cultures, which, which ripen at a, at, uh, at a higher temperature. <clears throat> Uh, so once you've got the milk heated up, then you add your cultures and you let that cheese ripening. And that happens for a specific amount of time that's noted in your recipe. And that can be as short as five minutes or so or up to an hour or even more, depending on the cheese. The cultures and the ripening time are central to creating the type of cheese that you desire. So it starts to acidify the milk. Step four is adding the rennet or sometimes you use an other kind of acid to set the curd but I'm going to talk about rennet here and this is where I'm going to elaborate a, a little bit. Rennet originally was produced solely from the stomach lining of a calf. Uh, today there are many kinds of rennet even vegetable rennets and can just laboratory kind of rennet in all cases, what happens is the, the rennet forms a chemical bond with the milk and causes it to coagulate into one giant curd. You have one giant blob of solidified milk. And the length of time that it takes to get to the point where the curd is completely formed and ready to cut into cubes, it varies according to the cheese that you're making. And once that time is reached, the curd is set and ready to be cut. And cutting will be in the next step. But right now, let's talk about the length of time that it takes to get to the point where the curd is completely formed. This is where flocculation comes in. Flocculation refers to the time when the casein matrix has just begun to form. And the curd has just begun to set. And that flocculation time is then multiplied by a factor. And the factor is different depending on the type of cheese. Examples are to multiply by a factor of 2 to 2.5 for a hard cheese like Parmesan, all the way up to multiplying by 4, 5, or 6 for moisture cheeses like Gouda, Camembert, or Stilton. So you would have a much longer set time for them. <clears throat> now, the, the curd at the time of cutting, it'll have a different strength. And the longer that it sets up, the stronger that curd gets. It's going to hold on to more moisture. A young curd that, say, only 30 minutes of time has passed will release, release much more whey. So low multipliers are used for harder, drier cheeses to get, it's going to, as I said, release more of the whey going to be drier. The soft brie or camembert will have a high multiplier and the curd's going to retain more whey and the time for setting the curd is going to be substantially longer. So with, it, with this method, instead of following a specific time based on the recipe, you can determine when is the best time to cut the curd with the milk you're using. So the recipe may say 45 minutes, but your calculation gives you 40 minutes. So you can see how you can be much more precise with this. I, I really can't wait to give it a try. By the way, I got this information from a YouTube channel that I love. It is Gavin Weber, G-A-V-I-N, Weber, W-E-B-B-E-R. And he is a master at making cheese at home. Uh, check out his channel. Just go to YouTube, search for Gavin Weber, and his channel will pop right up. He does all kinds of home cheese making recipes. Now, his method was so simple, I just had to share it. This will truly take your cheese making to the next level. Simply take a plastic lid the size of a small mouth mason jar. Like just about any pint sized jar with a plastic lid will be, that will be the right size of the lid. After adding the rennet to your milk, Gavin starts his timer and then he waits till about eight minutes into the process. And then he takes the lid, lays the flat top of the lid on the surface of the milk and spins it. This lid is really light and it will easily float. And as long as it continues to spin, you need more time. As soon as it stops spinning, you go to spin it and it doesn't really move. Note that time on your timer, multiply by the appropriate factor for the cheese that you are making. 
and uh, that's going to be the perfect time to cut the curd. And I'll leave a link to his video in the show notes. Uh, now, on to the next step. So, setting the curd with the rennet. It was the last one. Now that it's set into the curd, we're going to cut the curd. And cutting the curd can be tricky at home. I use a variety of utensils. Ideally, you have some kind of device specifically made for cutting the curd, especially the uh, the vertical cut is what you really, when you're in a round pot, you, you need something to cut that vertical. But uh, usually we don't have that. I use a 14 inch long spatula and I cut straight down into the curd in half inch increments one direction and then rotate 90 degrees and cut in the other direction. And that gives me my horizontal cut. So I've got these half inch tubes, but then I've got to cut them in the, in the third angle to make them into cu cubes. And so again, that's where it requires some way to cut uh, horizontally. I said vertical. Anyway. I'm getting my horizontals and verticals messed up. This is where having a tool uniquely designed for this process is great. Like a small wire curd harp is a blessing. It is such a blessing. I cannot describe it. You just, it's, it's got horizontal uh, wires on it. You stick it down into the milk and you just spin it around and it just cuts those, uh, cuts those long thin uh, tubes that you had made. Anyway. Without that, you do the best you can. I will cut at a 45 degree angle, starting at the at the top edge and then just going farther down, farther down, farther down. And I'm cutting these 45 degree angles and then I'll rotate 90 degrees and do it again. Sometimes I'll actually do it four times so that I actually um, cut a 45 degree angle in all four directions. And this method creates curds that are not exactly cubes, but it does work. The curds need to be pretty close to the same size. That's what your goal is, is to get them pretty close to the same size. And in this case, half inch cubes, sometimes, you know, three eighths or five inch eighths cubes, uh, depending on the cheese that you're making, or even smaller rice sized curds when you're making like a hard gruyere or something. Anyway, once you have your, your curds cut, you'll see that the whey starts separating. That's kind of a yellow or greenish liquid will separate from the curds. And then we're going to start cooking the curds. And this process involves raising the temperature of the curds and whey to the appropriate temperature for the particular cheese you're making. It could be as low as 100. It could be as high as 126 uh, for a thermophilic cheese. And the recipe will tell you the desired end temperature and how long it should take to get there. And then sometimes how long to hold it at that temperature as well. And this, all of this cooking and raising the temperature, this further develops your cultures. And you, you may even have other steps that are involved, such as washing the curd or adding salt. And I won't get into that now. That will have to be another podcast. Um, but the, but there you have it. You cook step six is cooking your curds. Then you drain them. Once you're done cooking them, then you're going to drain them. You're going to get them into the mold. Once it's reached the proper temperature and, and it's cooked for the proper amount of time, you can do that with a pot, uh, in a sink, on a stove. You just dip. You can dip the whey off. And usually though, you can also just pick those curds up and pour pour the whey and the curds into a colander that's lined with a cheesecloth to catch the curds. And then you would transfer those curds into your cheese mold or form. All right, so that's step seven. Drain off the whey, put the curds into the mold. Now, also, there's a step in here, salting the curd. And this can this can actually happen prior to getting the curds into the mold. But uh, most cheeses are sold, salted after being formed in the mold or immediately after coming out of the mold. After the cheese comes out of the mold, it might be put in a salt water brine or simply sprinkled with salt as with camembert. So salting, I put it kind of ahead of pressing the curds because sometimes it does happen at this point, but most of the time it actually happens after you've pressed the curds. Step nine is pressing the curds and there are various presses out there to accomplish this task. And the idea here is to get more of the whey out of the curds and to form up the, the shape of that cheese. Some pressing only requires the weight of the cheese itself and others require the use of some kind of press or a setup just where you can add weight on top of your mold. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, but if you're making cheddar, that does require really, really, some really, really good type of press. You need a lot of weight to press a cheddar cheese. When you do the cheddaring process, and make the the cheese curds, uh, it, it makes pressing a bit of a unique issue. But that's just for cheddar. All of your other ones, you should be able to just 
put weights on top of your molds at the very least. Now, last thing, aging the cheese. Step number 10, depending on the type of cheese, will determine what kind of rind your cheese is going to have. Some cheeses offer various types of rinds. You might even use a wax or a cream cheese coating. In any event, the, no the moisture needs to be maintained for the amount of ch time the cheese will age. And sometimes you're actually creating a specific rind, putting, uh, washing the rind, adding additional flavors onto the outside, and so on. So this, again, uh, at the time the cheese ages, increases, and deepens that flavor profile. And I'll have to do a separate uh, podcast on cheese aging. I might even have to do more than one podcast on aging cheese. That's a really in-depth kind of a, a, a process. So those are the steps. You sanitize everything, you heat the milk, add your cultures and ripen it for whatever time, wait, and then you add your rennet for whatever time that creates a solid curd. Then you cut the curd, you cook it, drain it out, put it into the molds, um, maybe salt it then, press the cheese into a form, and then uh, take it out of the form, and uh, then you're going to age it in, uh, in a proper environment for whatever time that you desire and uh, the last step is enjoy your cheese once you understand that these are the steps and they're simply altered in one way or another depending on the cheese that you're making it all starts to make sense you'll be amazed at how it's how a simple change in temperature the size of of the cut of the curds the amount of time and temperature to cook it all of that changes the flocculation time as we talked about it will all change your milk from one cheese to another and improve the quality if you do it correctly and my final thoughts that is it for this episode i hope you enjoyed the updates on the homestead i truly enjoy sharing our beautiful life with all of you and i look forward to meeting many of you in the future if i have not already your support is amazing i hope this episode helped you understand the the steps of cheese making a bit more clearly and once again you get those steps in mind you can make just about any cheese you want the method I described for determining flocculation is an easy addition for those of you already making great cheeses at home. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts or whatever podcasting service that you use and subscribe. Give me a five-star rating and a review. And if you like this content and want to help out the show, the absolute best way you can do that is to share it on all of your social media with any of your friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. It really, really helps the algorithms. And let me uh, just let them know about the Peaceful Heart Farm cast. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.